Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you online again. My name is Jing Wan. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics, while leading the collaborative call for cancer bioinformatics shared by IU Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Purdue University Center for Cancer Research. Today, I'm sitting with you to go through the bioinformatics analysis of ChIP-seq. ChIP-seq is a chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by next generation sequencing. There are two major applications of ChIP-seq. The first one, people use ChIP-seq to identify protein DNA interaction. In other words, we can use ChIP-seq to identify transcription factor binding locations. And the second application of ChIP-seq is that people can use it to detect the histone modification signals across the whole genome. Here is the major workflow of ChIP-seq analysis. And the first several steps is quite similar to the uh, analysis step you already seen from RNA-seq analysis. First, if necessary, we need a chain adapter sequences and the low sequence quality risk. In our call, we use a chain gatherer to do that, this work. And the second step is we have to map sequence risk to the reference genome. We needed to know where the sequence risk come from. And we use a bow tie to map in chip sequencing. And of course, for some map, so for some sequences with a low mapping qualities, we, we will use a software, as you already know, NGS UTERS to filter those rays. Like if the rays with a map Q score less than 10, we definitely we don't want to use them. There are, several, there are the unique features of ChIP-seq data. For example, and the, there are many duplicates due to PCR bias from ChIP-seq data. We have to mark and finally remove those risks from the analysis. And also people from the, some genome regions, they have a strong bias for the ChIP-seq data, regardless of the experiment design, cell line, whatever. And so definitely we don't want to include those risks for the analysis too. And for ChIP-seq data, we have a very specific biological quality control, try to see, try to examine the quality of ChIP-seq data. And we will use a fingerprint to, identify, to, to, to see how good or how bad of ChIP-seq data. And also we will try to identify enriched genome location to see whether the ChIP-seq makes sense or not. After cleaning the data, and we definitely, we need to identify the exact location for those and with the enriched ChIP-seq sequence. And in our call, we use a one tool called Max2 tool, Max tool to call the pigs. Let's begin with the first step, trimming adapter. As you already know from RNA-seq data analysis, most the software, they already remove the adapter automatically, but sometimes you may find adapter is DM, and so we have two chim loss adapter. So he, in our call, we use a chim gather to remove either pair end or single end chip seat. And then we will use a bow tie two to align the sequence to the whole genome, to the reference genome, either mouse, human, or any species. And of course, there are two different comments for either pair end or single end. You have to be careful when you use those lines. And you know, after mapping, after the alignment, and we may get a BAM file, and we convert the BAM file to same file. The reason is that from the same file, we may find the sequence align, alignment locations where the with 
map q score the map q score represent the probability of mapping position is wrong simply speaking the higher map q score we have a high confidence on the mapping quality but with a low mapping quality and the score is not good at all so in default we use a map q less than 10 as a cutoff to filter or remove those reads with the low mapping qualities our call use NGS users to do such a task. But from ChipSeq data, more, most often you can see some sequence reads like this one, identical sequence reads in the same locations. Those multiple identical sequence reads are displaced proportionally represented in the ChIP-seq data is not proportional whole genome. There is a strong bias. The strong bias is, might be caused by PCR amplification during sequence library preparation. The good thing is when we align the sequence, most of the software like Bowtie 2 already fragged the identical reads. So we don't need to do extra work, but we need to use some software like mark duplicates from Picar to mark this duplicates. Then when we use other software like Max2 to call the pick, they know, okay, some sequence already been marked as duplicates, though they don't need to think, they don't have to think, consider this sequence, they have to remove those redundancies. Now the question is how much Duplicate race is acceptable. There is a no certain answer, but the encode guideline gives said okay, if a sample has a less than 20% duplicates, the sample has a good quality in terms of a duplicate race. Another unique feature of chip seq data is uh, some genome regions, they may have a bias in the chip seq signal. In other words, some regions may have a, a normal, unstructured, very high signal risk counts in the chip seq data, we, regardless of the cell line or type of experiments you did. We call this uh, as a problematic regions. Because the amplification of noise in this region, which have a significant enrichment in the region, it consequently causes an inaccurate result when we call pick over. In 2019, Dr. Boyer's lab, they published the paper in scientific reports to list how to identify problematic regions for different species. And in the website, GitHub, and their lab also provided the full list of lists of problematic regions. They call it a blacklist. And also ENCODE used the same blacklist for analysis. They strongly recommend to identify and remove race from these problematic regions before we apply any threshold or before we do normalization, or even we, before we do peak calling, because the reads from these problematic regions can dramatically bias the result and cause inaccurate results. Now, after we clean the data, how can we judge the quality of individual chip samples? And from other lectures like Dr. Yunlong's lecture today, and you may know, and the specificity and of antibody and the sequence depths may determine the chip signal quality, no doubt, and which will determine the specificity and the sensitivity of chip signal result. And we know the chip signal capture the DNA fragments bound by protein or histone marks, then identify the locations. In other words, the site with the site with the enriched DNA fragments captured by ChIP-seq is are supposed to have a significant more sequence risk compared to other sites. And also we expect the enriched signals they are 
biologically meaningful signals rather than random noises. Of course, we expect a straightforward indication which can be used to examine the quality of chip seek before more downstream analysis, even before the peak calling. One tool, which is called a fingerprint from the package of deep tools, which was developed by the people from Max Planck Institute of Immunobiology and Epigenetics. The idea is very neat. For example, here we have a two samples cross old genome. We first we need to define a window of bin with a specific window size, like is a 100 base pair or 200 base pair or 500 base pair. Then we use uh, this window bin to scan the genome, and then we record the total counts or the highest coverage in the bin, in each bin. Then next step, we will sort the bin by the total counts or highest coverage, and then we get we sum over the read counts along the bin side, along the bin, different bins. Then we get a cumulative curve, like here. We have a two different cumulative curve for the samples shown on the left. One, the green one is co corresponds to S2, and the blue one corresponds to S1. But what's that mean, this one? Let's image one simplest case. If we have uh, one sample, with a random signal coming from everywhere. Or in other words, if we have some one sample with a uniform distribution across all genomes, when we plot the fingerprint, we may expect a straight diagonal lines here. Because all beings have an exact number of recounts or the highest coverage. So we get a diagonal line here. This is only ideal case. In most cases, the input or the kill is not a uniform distributor. It's always coming with uh, some level variation. It's like S2 here. So we may get a green line like this one. But still, this is almost a perfect fingerprint for an input sample, which means the signal has no bias on specific side. But for the two chip samples, we may expect some lines away from the diagonal line or away from the input. And what's that mean? When we look at the line, like a blue line here, you may find uh, several informations. The first one, you may find a point which was called the elbow point. And at this point, the curve suddenly go upwards. When we look at this basically example here, we found this point at about the point 0.97. And the y-axis, it reached to about the point 0.55. What's that mean? Which means before this point, 97% of all genomic beings they may include 55% of the number of reads. However, the rest 3% of genomic beings, they have other 45% of total reads. In other words, the signals are significantly enriched in 3% of this last 3% of genomic reads which may indicate a strong bias or strong enrichment in, for this region, which may be the true binding size. And also, it indicates the factor we tested here, H3K4 trimethylation, has a very lo localized a strong enrichment. However, I have to remind you, when we look at this one, even we find this a very exciting the curves, you have to be careful of the sequence depths. 
For sometimes, for the low sequence depths, even the input control, they may have a such a bias too. And this is another example for H3K36 of trimethylation. And similar to that one, and also we observe the X intercept here. What's that mean? This means that before this X intercept, there is no risk for, that, for those genomic beings. In other words, if we say, okay, X intercept is 0.1 in this case, then we say, okay, 10% of the entire genome do not have any risk, which is good too. I mean, like a good for the chip sample. Some cases you may find that the chip sample is not quite different from the input, which may be an issue, but may not. You don't be you, you don't need to be scared, and you have to think about what's the factor you are testing. And sometimes, if it is a factor, transcription factor, and you know they have a very specific binding site, then probably this indicates the chip sequence experiment failed. But for other factors, if they have a very broad binding area somewhere, and it doesn't mean that your experiment failed. It may mean something else. Here, I also list the common line we use that plot a fingerprint, which. Now, another question which can be used as the quality control from a biological perspective is we know for most proteins or histone markers, which play a critical role on transcription, transcription regulation. We expect a very strong signals observed around the gene transcription star site, like the figure we show here, which is H3K9 estimation signal. So before further in-depth analysis, we want to make sure the biological meaning of the chip signal is okay, is very good. So then we don't need to waste time, then we can move, move ahead. And there, has a couple of tools developed in the deep tool package, like a computer, computer matrix, which can be used to get the profile of the chip seek data along the transcription star side. After we get this one, and we can use another tool in the same package to plot the profile like this way. Then you can visualize this one and see how far the the enrichment region will be. And of course, from computer metrics, you can define your region from the transcription star side, either from upstream 5,000 to downstream 5,000, or whatever you want them, like upstream 2,000 to downstream 1,000 is fine. You just need to name the region of your interest in the comment line. Now, the next step is the most important one, is a peak calling. After we do quality control, if you are satisfied with the quality of chip safe data, then you need to identify specific genome location with those enriched signals. There are tens of algorithms which have been developed for peak calling. Here, I only show one of the most popular method used in peak calling, which is called model-based analysis of chip seek, MAX. The method was developed by Dr. Charles Liu's lab in Harvard University. They published the paper in 2008 in the genome biology. And this one, the MAX, is used to estimate the region of DNA protein interaction site, like a transcription factor binding site, or epigenetic modifications, mostly and histone modification regions. Max em empirically build a shift model and determine the shift size of chipsic tags, where the tags are shifted to the surprise right directions. And also, this method uses a dynamic points distribution to capture local bias in the whole genome, 
which allow us to deter to get more robust predictions on and the people already know the transcription the picture of transcription factor binding or histone modification might be very different for most of transcription factor and several histone modification people may find a very narrow binding peaks in other words the peaks in with the enriched the signal are very narrow from tens of base pair to hundreds of base pair however some histone modifications they may have a very broad enriched region from a thousand base pair to hundreds thousand base pair and other factors like high in poly 2 they may have mixed their pictures for example, and from a transcription star side, around transcription factor star side, they may have a very sharp or points the peak here, but on the gene body, they may have a very broad uh, binding regions. Picture of the transcription factor or histone modification is totally depend on the factor you are testing. So later, Shari Liu's lab that developed the software Max two to the version two, in because the older version they can only very effective to identify narrow peaks, but sometimes it fails when they try to identify broad peak. So in new version, they develop the model to link the nearby high highly enriched regions, enables Max two to find a large region, which are most of which are more appropriate for captured signal signals from histone modification events. In today's short lecture, I won't go through the details about the Max2. If you are interested, you can Google online, try to find the menu of Max2 and read the manuals. Here, I just want to simply show you the output of Max2. It's quite straightforward. It will give you some file like Excel file to show all the binding peaks or histone, uh, histone modification regions. And starting from the chromosome and the region star side and the side, and of course the total length. And also, there is an interesting information shows the summit position. Summit means the highest position of the peak. It's not necessary. To be in the middle of the peak. In the file show you the pile up of the sequence rays in the summit with a photo enrichment. In other words, compare to either control input or IgG with a p value and the q value after multiple test correction. Then you can get all this information to do further analysis. Now, ChIPSEC is not an individual file, even for the same factor, you may have uh, several biological or technical replicates for same conditions. Or you may have uh, different conditions you want to compare. What can we do? First, for the same conditions or for the replicates, we want to make sure the reproducibility is good. There are different ways we can do that. One way is we still use the bin things we used for the genome location. We try to see whether for count from each bin, but from different replicates, whether they are correlated. And or after you call the pick, you may say whether the overlap of the picks are very significant from different replicates. If you are satisfied with the reproducibility, if you have a high confidence on that, then how can you call unique pick? Not a pick from individual file, but you have to summarize the pick after that. There are two ways to do that. One is you can call pick from individual samples. Then you merge them together. In other words, if you say this pick can be called by all the replicates, then you have a very high confidence you call it a true pick. If a pig is only called by one or few of replicates, then you may ignore that. Another 
common way people do is uh, I can see many publications after examining the reproducibility. If reproducibility is pretty good, people merge all the chipset replicates together before pick calling. They merge the alignment file together. Then they call the pick based on the merged file. In other words, they put them together, get a one unique pick. Okay. And for different conditions, and we also can use a PCA principal component analysis, like what you have seen from the ISIC analysis. We use a PCA to examine the similarity and the difference between samples from different conditions. And of course, there are different, there are many methods which can be performed to identify differential peaks from different conditions. And I won't discuss this part today, but I believe Dr. Li Chen will later to give us more introductions about the differential peak calling in his lecture. After we do our analysis, or after you get the bioinformatics analysis from bioinformaticians, you get a list of the peaks they identified. You got a, or you may get a list of picks with a differential binding site from different conditions. You still have a question. You want to see, maybe you have a doubt about the result. You want to see by your eye, your own eyes, to see what's the, what's the chip seek looks like. So we can help you that without any issue. We convert alignment file to one specific format file, like we call the big week. And then we can send the, the big wheel file to UCSC genome browser, like this one. After you get a link from the bioinformaticians, you can input the specific genome location or genes of your interest. And then you can take a look at the profile of ChIP-seq data. Here, I show you one example. We select one gene, which is called SAMD4A. You can see the gene structure like this way. And uh, this is upstream or promote region of, and uh, we have three samples. Duplicate of H3K27 trimestration and one input file. And it's good you can see for this gene, and there is a strong binding signal of H3K27 trimestration particularly when you compare with the input, you have a strong confidence of that one. This you may think is a true signal of H3K27 translation. And I just remind you, here is the scale of the picture you selected. Here you can see, and H3K27 translation as a raw pick, it covers over 2000 base pair from this case. And of course, you can use other browser like WashU at Epigenome browser to do the similar thing. And also you can input the BAM file from your computer and do the IGV and we can observe the similar thing too. That, this is the short lecture I will give you today. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact us anytime. And we will be very pleased to help you from our side. Thank you very much.